yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's it's a um, it's fascinating for me also because um, in biology you see this everywhere that um, and and the DNA drives so many sophisticated behaviors, so many sophisticated things in in, in our body and our world. So um, and, and DNA is actually much more complicated. It, it, it's 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 a strand, but it's a very sophisticated computer program. I, you know, we won't go into that, but it's extremely sophisticated. And, and, and now that we have CRISPR technology, it, it's, it gives us a lot of capability, not just for human DNA, but, but all types of DNA. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the comparison. We're going to compare the child slash teen, teen well, actually not compare it to the, the comparing is later, but um, next I want to go into the child and teen brain, the next uh, uh, two phases of, of the, um, of the five, um, stages of, 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 of brain development. So during this phase, mostly what's happening is that the physical changes continue to occur. Okay? They continue to occur um, well in throughout the teen years. So the brain is physically growing, um, ha but however, the environment also plays more and more ro uh, stronger roles. It plays an increasing role in, in um, the person's development, in their brain's development. Uh, so neuronal growth, okay? one of the things that happens from, from birth onward is that at the time of birth, so the, the cortex, and I'm going to, here I'm talking about the, the, the cortex. The cortex is that outer envelope. This is the, and when, when most people think of the brain, they think of that as the brain, but that's not the entire brain. That's just one part of the brain. It's an important part, but that's one part of the brain. So that part of the brain, when um, the baby, before the baby is born in the fetus, it has roughly three layers of, of structure within the neocortex. The neocortex is the outermost layer of the, of the cortex. Right? Um, and after birth, that neocortex starts to, starts to expand into six layers. Okay? And originally it was thought it was between five and eight layers, but now the neuroscience is coalescing around number six, that it seems to be around six layers. But you know, don't hold the number six you know, strict. It, it's, it's roughly six to, eight, six to seven layers that, that it grows into in all humans. And um, that happens pretty quickly into the first few years of life. And again, this is, there's no hard and fast rule that it happens by the age of two or that happens by the age of three, because in different parts of the neocortex, it may develop earlier and other parts of the neocortex will develop later. And this is actually another part that, that I'm going to go into later. I, I'll, let me explain it now, because remember, we, we look at the, the brain, the entire central nervous system as a single tube, right? But if you think of the brain as a continuation of that tube, the, the frontmost part of that tube, right? So this neuronal growth, also occurs in that tube at bit different time periods. So the first, the, the um, earliest, the, the most primitive part of the brain develops and finishes its growth first. Okay? So the brain stem, which is con connected to our spinal cord, that finishes its growth first. And the cerebellum and the um, thalamus, hypothalamus, the singlet cortex, you know, all of the internal, the midbrain structures, they develop next. And then the cortex develops last. And within the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, which is the newest part of the human brain, okay? most other animals don't have a prefrontal cortex. We do, and we have a large one. That, that's the last area to develop. Um, so this layer, layerization of the brain, okay? in, the neo, in, the, in the prefrontal cortex, the neocortex of the prefrontal cortex will finish its uh, layerization latest probably when you're after age 18, okay? And the other parts of the brain will finish uh, much earlier. So for example, your sensory motor sections may start to, to develop this, you know, first week of after birth, and it may finish around the first month or six months of, of, of birth, after birth. That, you know, the, because you need to be able to control all your muscles early in life, right? And you need your, your um, sensory systems to be working early in childhood. So those parts of the brain will continue their full development early, probably within the first year of life. Um, and the parts that you don't need, for example, the thinking part of your brain, the analyzing part of your brain, the planning part of your brain, you don't need those in your infancy. You need those in your teenage years. So they start to develop in your teenage years. And this is the reason why teenagers do a lot of risk taking, because those parts of the brain have actually not developed yet. They, they've developed only in rudimentary ways. Um, so this neuronal growth begins um, after birth but it happens over a long extended period of time. And again, it follows a similar path of the evolutionary path that this, this curving folded together neural brain 
actually um, further develops um, along that path. So the end of the neural tube is the last area that develops and the beginning part of the neural tube or the, or the beginning part of the brain, the brain stem begins developing first. So all of this, uh, the physical changes primarily peak, excuse me, around age seven. And that's in, in that uh, chart, the graph that I had, that's the reason why I had that 95% line, that all of the physical growth peaks around age seven. Um, and then it starts to slowly decline onto, onto our, our senior years. I mean, it actually does decline. And this is where um, the question in, in the question answer, we can to some extent reduce this, but it is difficult because you know genetics to some extent plays your environment. Um, for example, the nutrition that you have, um, whether you have stress in, or not, you know, many aspects affect this. Um, whether you have physical, your health is physical health, and your heart and your other aspects of your body are, are physically fit or not, um, they also affect it. So um, neuronal growth continues for the rest of your life, but it, it peaks around se age seven. And then it, it so, so this, this, this is just the neurons, okay? Um, now, there's also another part of our brain, which are the glial cells, okay? And this is something most people don't understand, and we don't talk, although in neuroscience, we do understand it well, but average, the general public doesn't understand this very well. But glial cells are actually as important, if not more important than our neurons, because the glial cells are basically what are necessary. They support all of our neurons, and they support in many different ways. Here I've listed just some of the ways, but in the beginning, and here I'm talking about the physical changes. This is why I listed only the physical change aspects of the glial cell. Glial cells, they are the cells that nourish our, our, our neurons. For example, they provide energy, they provide um, oxygen transport, they provide structure. So the structure and the layers that when the, these neurons grow into six different layers, the way that that happens is because these glial cells form a scaffolding, very much like a scaffolding when you're building a building. They actually grow into the scaffolding structure, which helps the neurons follow that scaffolding. So the neurons actually follow the scaffolding step by step by step. And then they grow into the six layer structure. It's phenomenal. It's, it's beautiful when you look at how it happens. Um, so, so the glial cells are very important for that. The topology of the brain. So when we talk about different regions of the brain, that the cerebellum has different structures and, and the, um, the, the, um, the, the basal ganglia has, has different structure. You know, the different areas of the brain, the topology depends on the types of glial cells in some areas of our brain. And the glial cells are roughly, I, I think there are around 40 different types of glial cells. And so depending on the type of glial cell in one region and, and, and the ratio of glial cells to, to other glial cells will depend on which types of neurons survive and the, and the way that those neurons grow and the, and, the, and the morphology of those neurons. So even neurons, there are many types of neurons, roughly seven or eight types of neurons that we have. Um, and the types of neurons that we have are completely based on the glial cells that surround them. Okay? Um, another aspect is myelination. Okay? And I'm gonna explain. I, I just wanna quickly uh, spend a minute on the glial cells. So it looks like glial cells are the support mechanism. They are the ones providing the structure and kind of the logistics for, for these uh, neurons, which is doing most of the work, but they are being completely supported, structured by the glial cells. Is that fair way of thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me, let me, give, let me give another example to, 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 to help. I mean, that's excellent. I'm, I'm going to go deeper here into this because I realize that this is something important to understand. So if you think of a company, any company, it doesn't matter the size, any company, okay? Now, the company, the most important thing that the company is doing is it's moving information around to do what it needs to. Okay? Information is the most important aspect of a company's function. Okay? Even when a company is producing physical products, okay, even if a company is not in, involved in a, in, in a services industry, even if it's producing physical products, the way you produce the right physical product is that you have a recipe for how to manufacture that product, which is information, right? You have staffing who are trained in how to do the manufacturing or how to communicate or how to ship products, right? So information is the key of a company, okay? So in the brain, information is what neurons do. Neurons handle all the information they handle the electrical signals that pass around the brain. Okay? Glial cells are everything else that a company has. So for example, the physical building of the company is part of the glial cells. Okay? The, the HVAC system, which heats and air conditioning and the heating system in the building is the glial cells. Okay? Glial cells provide the oxygenation, the carbon dioxide. They provide the blood, blood supply. 
they provide the heat, the, removing excess heat or cooling the brain when, when it gets too hot. The glial, the glial cell, in a company, you have the, the physical floors if you're in a multi-story building, right? The glial cells provide that scaffolding structure that I described. The glial, glial cells also have a hierarchy of management, okay? Just like in a company, you have to have management structure. So glial cells, are, so around those 40 different types of glial cells, there are managed, and this is encoded through the DNA. These glial cells have a hierarchy within themselves of what does what first. And the glial cells also have, have um, a function of, of the um, immune system because the brain has a separate immune system for the rest of the body. There's something called a blood-brain barrier which separates the brain from the body. So the brain does not use the body's immune system intentionally because it can, that would expose it much more. And the brain is, is the most vital organ for us, so it has its own internal immune system. And the glial cells provide much of that. So the glial cells are extremely, extremely important for brain. What's the number of glial cells as compared to neurons? Okay, so I actually had some slides on this, which I took out because, but, but, so the number of glial cells varies based on brain region, okay? And it can vary tremendously. And, and in some areas, so for example, in, uh, so I'm doing this off of memory, so I probably will get this wrong, but I believe it's a cerebellum where the number of glial cell ratios um, is, actually, I'm not, I'm not gonna, so I think it's, it's this, the cerebellum has about a one to two ratio, which is not a big difference, okay? Um, of, I'm trying to remember if it has more, I think it has fewer glial cells. I think, yeah, the, the, the cerebellum has much more neurons and has fewer glial cells than other structures. So many of the limbic system structures of our brain have many more glial cells and many fewer neurons, okay? Almost on the order of 40 more, so for 40 to 50, um, I think it, in some areas of the brain, it's even up to 70 times. So for every neuron, you have 70 supporting glial cells, okay? Most of the brain, it's around 10, 15. On average, the, the ratio is around 15, 13 to 15 glial cells for every neuron in the brain, okay? And the neocortex is actually low. The neocortex actually has more neurons. And again, it depends on within this layered structure and depend on whether we're talking about the gray matter or white matter. The white matter has more glial cells than, than, than uh, uh, neuron cells. And that's intentional because white matter actually has very few neurons. The gray matter has much more neurons, but even there, the gray, the, the gray matter, the, the neur neuron to glial cell ratio, I don't remember exactly. I think it's around eight to one. It's, it's less in other, other areas. Um, so this is the point where, you know, we're gonna talk about myelination, myelination but this is the point where I, I'm going to talk about white matter and gray matter because this is what myelination is about. And we talked about this in prior uh, discussions, but I'm gonna do a quick synopsis here because it's important. Some of you may not have, have, have seen that. Um, so, and, and this is mainly our neuro uh, mainly our cortex, which is the that enve enveloping um, most recent part of our brain, our, our most uh, uh, newest part of our brain, which gives us the cognitive advanced cognitive functions. Um, so, not only is it split in a right left hemisphere and a right right hemisphere, but it's split if you think of it in terms of height. Okay, if you think of the center of the of the brain and you moving outward in a radial fashion to the outermost layer of the brain, if you think of it that way. It, the outermost layer of the brain has what's known as the gray matter. And the gray matter is in multiple layers. Okay, so when I when in, in this slide, when we talk about the six layers, those six layers of the gray matter are the outermost layers of the brain, outermost layers of the cortical regions of the cortex. Okay, and the innermost part of the brain, now it's not so simple because the innermost part of the brain actually doesn't have the cortex, it actually has the, the, um, the midbrain. The midbrain is, is mostly in the innermost part. But if you think of the, the cortex toward the innermost, so just before you hit the midbrain, the lowest part of the cortical regions are where white matter resides. And if you were to look at from the, from the amount of area, okay, the thickness of the, of the um, gray matter, the gray matter is actually very, very thin. It's on the order of a few millimeters thin. Okay? So most of the brain, the inside part of the cortical brain, is all white matter, okay? Um, and white matter is this third bullet called myelination, okay? And myelination is, um, in the simpl simplest way to describe it is I have to, I have to explain, and I don't have the slides for this. If you, if you want more information on this, you can go back to one of our earlier discussions on this, or I'm, I may go into this a little more into another, uh, there's another talk we're gonna have where we go more depth into the physical brain. But um, if you think of a neuron, the simplest form of a neuron is, is a neuron is a, is a single, 
cell, it, it's a single um, brain cell. It's the simplest form of a brain cell, um, which actually carries information. Okay, the glial cells are also brain cells, but they carry no information. They do support activities only. The neuron is the only brain cell which carries signals, which carries information in the form of electrical signals, electrochemical signals. Um, and so neuron has three main parts. It has the cell body, the nucleus, okay? It has what's known as an axon, which is a long, long fiber, okay? And it has what are known as dendrites. And dendrites are, you can think of it as a dendrite tree. Dendrites are many, many, many types of fibers that come off of the axon. The axon is like, think of it as a circle, as, as, a, as a sphere at the center. And the sphere has many, many like hairy, hair, hair like particle, hair like projections that come off of it. And those are the dendrites. It has this very, very single long, thick tail, which is the axon. Okay? And these three regions are, are the most um, basic part of a neuron. They're, they're, each of these are actually much more sophisticated than that, but I'm, I'm just in a simple way, these are the three. And so when you have two different neurons um, that want to pass information between each other. Oh, looks like. Um... Looks like folks, uh, Sanjay is still having a problem. Uh, he will be back in a minute or so. So let me go ahead and uh, unmute people. Um, so, okay. Um, so, so far, the biggest thing that I've learned today is the idea of glial cells. And probably, I think myelination also looks like a problem, or lo looks like a topic of the same kind of scale as uh, the glial scales. I mean, you know, kind of going back to my favorite thinker, uh, Louis Sullivan, it is kind of thinking about function and form. So it looks like the function of the brain is being performed by the neurons. They are the ones who are actually carrying all the information, but the structure of the brain is enormously complex. It's not just a bunch of neurons connected to each other. It is a very structured way in which those things are connected. And it looks like the glial cells are the ones that are providing the structure. So different parts of the brain that require probably more structure have more glial cells and there looks like there is, I mean, this is looking at it very simply. He's talking about there being 40 different kinds of glial cells and eight different kinds of neurons. So what I'm getting from this is that the actual structure of the brain, uh, the it's not just that the number of neurons involved is massive, but that they are connected in this intricate structure. The other thing, I, other, other point, which I always find interesting is that the later parts are the ones that are the controlling parts. So the fundamental parts, like things like the brain stem, control things like, um, you know, uh, temperature regulation of, of the body. Then you have kind of the limbic system, which handles all the reactions, like the emotional reactions. And then you have the cortex, which makes all kinds of connections. And then you have the prefrontal cortex, which actually is doing the direction of, of the whole thing. So the higher parts sit on the top of the lower parts. The lower parts are doing most of the actual work. The higher parts are doing kind of the control mechanism. Welcome back, Sanjay. Yeah, sorry about this. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I think- it's... No problem. I think one of the things that has happened is that the Zoom, latest Zoom update, there is a problem with that. I was running a event for my company and our Zoom went down three times. Three different people had the same problem. There is a problem with the latest Zoom update. That's exactly uh, so what I was thinking. I'm, I was thinking the exact same thing because that I, everything else is, is, 
yeah yeah no that is that is it that is what the problem is and they will fix it they are they are probably going to they've been getting a lot of complaints i'm sure and they will they'll fix it next time but go on sir okay so let me um just screen share again so um i mean uh it says um i don't think you have screen share oh just a second i have to i have to make you a co-host hold on uh yes go ahead so um we were talking about the uh um so the myelination and and the the axon uh, the, the neuron and so if you have two different neurons that, that want to communicate what happens is that so i'm not sure where i cut off was it did every did you hear me describe the three parts of the neuron uh yes yes fully and and then i started talking about two different neurons how they communicate is that uh, that that one we did not get okay that's that's where i believe it cut off yeah so um so if you have two different neurons each of them having their three three regions um and they physically would be close to each other um what would happen is that the the axon of one neuron would be near the dendrites of the other neuron so then think of the dendrites as like hairy like fur like it's not it's not that dense it's actually you know not not um a, a typical neuron might have you know between uh 5 and 50 different um dendrites um and it probably will have one um uh, axon but that axon shape can be quite complex it doesn't have to be a single line so um the axon from one neuron would would grow toward the dendrite of the next neuron the toward this neighboring neuron okay and this is this is the reason why I use the word grow is because that's important and this is this is a critical aspect of why your brain is the way it is and many of the aspects of learning and and as we grow into adults um because this is actually what happens in our brain is that the axons grow in a certain direction the dendrites also grow in a certain direction that's one aspect that these two areas grow toward each other or they can actually grow apart also because this is what we're talking about you know in in this slide you see that use it or or uh, to build it and then use it or lose it so when you when you actually use your brain you're actually causing the axons and dendrites to re, to connect and when you don't use a part of your brain those um connections disengage or they become more distant um so this is important there are other areas also the other things that happen in the brain also uh, for example uh, pairing and pruning that happen um and other things and and neurons also die so uh, when a neuron dies you know that that's more catastrophic but um so the, these two neurons that are trying to communicate so the axon is is growing toward the dendrites of the second neuron and the dendrites are actually either growing toward or they're becoming more diverse they're they're growing into a broader set of trees like they're branching out toward the axon um either either can happen or both can happen um and what happens is that the axon and the dendrite of these two neurons never physically touch they never touch there are actually many biological mechanisms that make sure that they never touch they're not supposed to touch what happens is that they come extremely extremely close to each other a few microns away and that gap between the end of the of the axon which is called the axonal terminus and where the dendrite happens where the dendrite ends that gap is called a synapse and that's where information flow happens and that's where neurotransmitters get uh released and absorbed that's where the information flow between these two neurons happens and it happens in very very complex ways because the axon and the dendrite you can have multiple neurotransmitters released from the same uh uh neuron from the same axon of a, of a neuron or you can have just one type um and also there are glial cells all around, all around these neurons glial cells also absorb these neurotransmitters and some glial cells actually emit their own neurotransmitters so the, so it's a very very complex diverse environment that our brain exists in these neurotransmitters are doing all kinds of things to glial cells and to neurons and and you know etc so so this myelination that we're talking about is that these axons that grow toward another neuron when they in in a young brain these axons just grow normally toward the, toward um toward the, its neighboring neurons and they grow at a at a certain rate they 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 can't grow very rapidly and one of the things that has to happen in the advanced brain in a teenager's brain and adult brain is that these axons have to grow very very long distance they have to grow from one half of the for example when the two hemispheres connect the corpus callosum the, 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 these are actually axons these are single axons that start in let's say the left left hemisphere and they grow to many many centimeters long you know 10 15 cent 12 centimeters long from the left half of the brain 
all the way across the corpus callosum into the right half of the brain. And they might connect into neuron, another neuron, another set of neurons in the right brain. So one neuron in the left brain will connect into a few neurons in the right brain and vice versa. The same thing happens reversely in the front to back. Neurons in the front of the brain might connect into the back of the brain. Neurons that, that are formed with our, from our vision, from our, from our, from our uh, retina, will actually connect into the back of our brain, the, the um, occipital areas of our brain where vision centers are. So these axons are extremely important in our brain. And these axons actually in the child's brain are, well, the child's brain is physically small also. Okay? It's physically smaller than adult brain. So they don't have to grow as far, but because it takes so long for them to grow, um, it's, it's more difficult, for, and this is one of the reasons why there are not as many axons or, or there are not as many external connections in a child's brain. Now, one of the things that happens that helps axons is called myelination. Myelination is basically, there's a specific type of glial cell, there are actually two types of glial cells, but in the brain it's one type. So a specific type of glial cell, what it does is it grows in a certain way that it wraps itself around the axon. And more than one, so if you have a glial, if you have an axon that's, let's say, um, uh, two centimeters long, okay, you'll have thousands of different glial cells. Each of those glial cells will wrap around a tiny section of, of that axon. So all of these thousand glial cells will all wrap around different parts of the, of the axon, and together, they'll almost entirely cover the axon. Okay? And these glial cells are myelination, myelinated cells, and what, what they're doing is they have a high fat content, they have a high, high lipid content. And what they do is they supercharge that axon. So an axon that has this myelination that's happened to it becomes very fast. The energy that flows within it becomes very fast moving. Okay? The electrical impulse shoots through it at very rapid rates. Whereas a neuron that has an axon that is not myelinated, it's much slower moving. The energy and the, and the signal moves at a much slower rate. Okay? So myelination is very important for that reason because it allows very rapid movement of, of, of information. And these, this myelination also happens not just within the brain, it happens in our spinal cord, throughout our peripheral nervous system. So in all parts of our body, we have myelination happening around our, around nerves, around, around axons. Axons are basically what ner when nerves in our body are basically axons. So the longest nerve in our body, the longest nerve in most people's bodies is roughly six feet long, five feet long. And it goes from our brainstem down to our big toe. That's usually, most people have a single neuron that traverse it, that some people have two and some people have three neurons that, that cover that length. So the longest neuron that you might have in your body would be around five feet long. So just, just a little bit of tidbit. So, so these neurons can, can be extremely long and, and they, they're, they're myelinated. And if they're myelinated, they are super fast. So myelination is a, a improved form of a neuron. It's a faster form of neuron. And what's important, why, why myelinate, why, you know, again, if you remember, we're talking about gray matter and white matter. So myelination, the color of the myelin sheath is white because it's primarily composed of lipids, of fat molecules. If you're familiar with, with fat, fat most people think of as yellow colored, but it's actually more yellow, yellowish, whitish colored. Um, and um, so all of these axons that are covered in myelin, excuse me, actually have a whitish tint. They, they have a whitish color. And because all of these axons grow in the central part of our cortex, okay? So the central area of our, of our cortical brain is mostly myelinated axons. There are very, very few neurons there. There are very, very few um, um, uh, neuronal um, uh, cell bodies there. Most of the cell bodies, most of the nuclei of, of neurons exist in the gray matter. And these ne neuronal cells, these ne uh, neuronal cell bodies, actually because they have DNA, because they have other structures, they're darker colored. They take on a darker grayish, blackish tint. And that's what makes the gray matter in our brain gray colored because there's so many neurons. These neurons have a darker tint. That would, that's what makes our gray matter gray because it's, it's, it's a very, very high density area of neurons. And the white matter has very few neurons that has a very high density of myelinated axons. So if you want to think of the difference between the white matter and gray matter, white matter is the part that really does the thinking, okay? And the, sorry, no, no, I, the gray matter is the part that really does the thinking. Okay, that's where the neurons are. White matter is the part that connects all of those cells. It's, it's the information highway, you can think of it. It's the highway system within our brain that carries all of those sig signals from all of the different parts of our brain. 
and, and into our body. Okay? So white matter and gray matter are both important. And, and both of these, gray matter and white matter, are driven by usage. The more you use them, the more you use the different regions of our brain, or the more you use a specific neuron or a specific clump of, cluster of neurons, they will tend to grow. Their axons and dendrites will tend to grow toward each other, and they'll form connections. And these connections are what cause what learning is. When you learn something, there is a physical growth of either a dendrite or an axon or both. There are physical growths in our brain. That is what learning is. So when we learn, and when we have the, all learning is encoded in our brain in terms of memory. So every memory means that our brain has grown in, in a tiny area, in a tiny way. Okay. So the next bullet, the last bullet, is that's where I'm talking about learning. So learning. Learn, so that's, you know, I was talking about this growth of physical structures of neurons is what learning is. And learning is encoded physically in the brain in our memories. And, and, and memory isn't just, we don't have just one area of our brain that has memory. Okay? Although many people think of hippocampus and other areas that, that characterize memory. Memory is actually every part of our brain. Memory is stored in every part of our brain, but some parts of our brain encode more specific types of memory than other types of other parts of our brain. I'm not going to go into that right now. So learning, so, and, and while the child brain, so in the first years of life, the child brain is doing an enormous amount of learning, right? And most of the learning that, that the infant brain is doing is it's doing learning about its environment through its senses. It's doing learning about how to control its body because the infant, infant brain does, it obviously cannot walk, but many people don't realize it, it actually can't even control its, its, um, the lens in its, the eyes to be able to focus because the lens has not fully formed and its eye muscles have not, have, they form, but, but they're not um, as well controllable. Um, I mean, in, in the human brain, there are certain parts that develop from the time of infancy. So for example, um, our gag reflex, our sucking instinct, our reflex, or some of our nerve, uh, you know, reflex conditions, like for example, when you hit, um, you know, our knee, um, the, or, you know, the, the, there are various types of reflex that we have. Those are fully developed in an in infant at time of birth. Um, but there are many other parts of our brain that have not fully developed. So, for example, our vision system is mostly developed, but the baby cannot see clearly because the, the lens and some other parts of the brain, of its optical system and the brain, have not completely developed. But within the first roughly two months, um, it, it finishes developing. So, around one and a half to two months, the baby starts to see more and more clearly, and its vision system actually starts to help. So, um, but the rest of its senses, so a, a very young baby, days old and weeks old, is actually using its, all of its other senses to sense its environment. So it learns to recognize its mother and father from, its, from, the smell, from their body smell. Not, not body smell is an odor. Body smell, we all have, we all have uh, smells that are not odorous, but they're chemical signatures of our body. And the baby can recognize the chemical signature of their parents. It learns to recognize that as one of the first things. Um, and the temperature, sensation, the skin, you know, skin, skin touch. So when you touch a baby, that develops its brain. It develops many of its sensory parts of its brain, the parietal lobe, sensory, um, uh, sensory motor cortex. Th these areas of the brain are very important. They develop when you hold a baby, when you coddle a baby, when you cradle a baby, you know, when you talk to a baby, all of these things that you're doing when you stimulate its senses, its physical, it's throughout its body, it's all of its skin, its hearing, its eyes, its taste, all of the senses that the baby has when you stimulate it, you're causing growth in its brain regions. And it's, you're causing the growth to happen in a certain way that the baby learns, use the senses in a better way, in a more sophisticated way. And its senses also learn to recognize the, the the environment, the, the environment that the baby lives in, in a more sophisticated way. So, for example, if a baby is born in a noisy environment, they auditorily, you know, if it's born in a very noisy environment, that baby's auditory system will develop in a very, way that's very different than another baby that grows in, a, in an environment where there's almost no noise, where it's almost, you know, quiet all the time. Their auditory system will develop in very, very different ways. And if you take a baby that's grown up in a very noisy environment and you put them into an environment where there's almost no noise, that baby will actually exhibit symptoms of, of being deaf because the brain has developed in a way that it's learned to tune out a lot of sounds. And when that baby goes to an area where there's so few sounds as it is, it starts to, its brain is not able to pick up the few sounds and it, 
it exhibits aspects of, of being deaf, but it, it's actually not deaf. So these are some of the, you know, the strange things that can happen, but these things happen early on in our, in our infancy. And again, this is, this is what gives us the flexibility because if we're born in, you know, in one country versus another country, or if we're born in an area where um, the water, you know, that we primarily rely on water and rivers and lakes versus another culture where they may live in a mountainous area, right? So if a baby grows in one area versus another area, its brain will actually develop in very different ways. Its brain will develop and adapt to the environment in which it grew in. Um, and that's, that's, that's extremely important. So all, during all of this time that it's during, uh, learning is happening, many, many activities that are happening. I, I described this in an earlier uh, talk, but right now I'm just going to go into some of these. So pruning is one of the main things that's happening. So we already know that the brain has already developed. It's already grown to a certain point. Right? But after it's grown, and remember, we, we talked about the neurons of an infant baby being close to 100,000, right? And it starts to diminish from that point on. So pruning is one of the things that happens, causes the diminishing of neurons. Neurons actually die. They actually um, uh, shrivel up and they disappear. And the, uh, the glial cells actually eat it up, kind of. They, they take all of the materials from the neuron and they use it to build other things in the brain. So the glial cells don't waste. When that neuron disappears, it doesn't get wasted. It gets reabsorbed and it gets used to do other things in the brain, to, to help the brain in other ways. So pruning is something that develops almost instantly after the time of birth. And pruning is where, and, and again, pruning happens in, in, in the gray matter, which is the six layers in, in, the, in the cortical region. And in the other parts of the brain, outside the cortex in the cerebellum and the, the midbrain and the hindbrain, we actually have also have pruning occurring, but they're, they're occurring in different ways. And again, the ratio of, of, of white matter to, to gray matter is different in those areas. The ratio of glial cells to neuron, neuronal cells are different. So pruning happens in very different ways depending on the part of the brain that it, that it, it exists in. But you know, primarily, I'm gonna, from this point on, I'm going to talk mostly about the, the cortex because that's really the thinking part of the brain that we're dealing with. So pruning, pruning in, the, in the cortex is very important because it, and I'm trying to see if I have a, a slide that um, might show this. I tried to find. So here, here's a slide that shows differentiation between um, neurons at, at age, so newborn, one month, nine month, two years old, and adult. So across this, the, these five, five categories, the number of neurons actually are decreasing. Okay? Um, and if you look closely, the leftmost side is, has the most number of neurons. Even though some of the neurons are tiny and other neurons are quite large, um, the rightmost side of the brain, most of the neurons that are there are the large ones. Tiny neurons are almost gone because they've been pruned out over this time period. Um, also, um, the reason why we have so many neurons at birth is that at birth, we really don't know what environment we're going to, we're going to be born into, right? We don't know if the environment we're born into requires our visual system to be more sophisticated or our taste buds to be more sophisticated or our skin to be more sophisticated, right? Our DNA gave our brain the ability to, to, to grow in different ways, to, to um, fine tune different aspects of itself. And so when we're born at the time of birth, our brain has the option of going into any one of those directions based on where we're born, the environment we were born in, and the, even the social environment that we're born in. So if we're born into an environment, for example, if a baby is born into an environment where there is no auditory speech, all language is visual, okay, then that baby's auditory system will not develop very much. Okay? Um, and the, the, system, the area that traditionally is, is part of the auditory system will actually be taken over used for probably the visual system. So the visual system of that baby will expand into the auditory area. And the auditory area actually will do visual processing because that baby is not stimulated in an auditory way because there's very, very little sound in, in his environment, his or her environment. And the brain actually can do that. This is a part of neuroplasticity. So the fact that the brain is born with so many neurons allows that to happen. All of these neurons, the baby, we nobody, you know, it's impossible to know which of these neurons are important at, at time of birth, but depending on the sensations that the baby gets from its environment. Remember, everything that happens in the baby's brain is coming from the outside. There's very little that's happening from the inside because the baby's brain has almost no experiences that it, it can rely on. But as we grow, more and more of what happens in our brain happens from inside of the brain itself. So a teenager's brain much more is happening from the memories that the teenager has of growing up 
It has memories of its friends. It has memories of its parents, teachers. It has memories of the foods that it's eaten, the, the, the food that the, baby, that the teenager likes. All these memories are already encoded in a teenager's brain. But a baby's brain doesn't have any of those memories. So baby's brain is primarily working off of external stimuli used from its, from its sensory system. So all of these extra neurons are, are pruned based on which sensory systems are most used by the baby and most stimulated by the baby's environment, by their parents, by the environment that the baby lives in. And then after that, after we get into the social behavior and social um, programming, you might say social learning, then based on how we teach our children, if we teach our children a single language or if we teach them in a multilingual environment, the brain will develop in different ways, right? The auditory system will become more sophisticated if the baby learns more than one spoken language, right? Or if the baby learns Artistic skills, like for example, if it learns to play the piano and to draw and to paint and to write, if it learns all of those things, then the motor control skills of its hand will develop much more and the neurons in the motor, uh, the um, uh, motor cortex specific to the hand will retain most of the, neur most of the neurons okay, um, into adulthood because that baby will, will and, and that's the reason why if a baby learns to paint or play the piano, and obviously babies don't, but children do. So if, the, if, if a five-year-old learns to play the piano, when that baby grows into the adulthood, they will retain the ability to play the piano because those neuronal cells have formed early on and the density and structure of the neurons don't reduce substantially. But in other parts of the brain, for example, the part of the brain that has to do with the taste buds, that will probably diminish over time. So that part of the brain will tear away most of the neurons because most of us are not living in an environment where we're, 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 we're eating very, very sophisticated types of foods. Most of us are eating foods that have very simple flavors, and therefore our taste buds and those parts of our brain pare down fairly rapidly. Also, our visual system probably does not pare down because we live in sophisticated visual environments. Most of our environments that we live in today are sophisticated, but if a baby lives outdoors, the baby is born outdoors, the outdoor environment really doesn't change much. You know, whereas indoors, our environment is much more sophisticated. So the visual system of a baby born outdoors in a more rural climate or a more um, primitive climate will not develop as much as somebody born in a sophisticated climate where there's writing and literature and computers and, and art and things like that. Um, so hopefully this is starting to you know, make sense. So pruning is, is a very important part of, of, of learning. Interconnection. So this is, again, we're talking about myelination, we're talking about the axons, the white matter. Interconnections is all about white matter. White matter is the internal part of the brain where all of these neurons connect to each other. And the more connections you have, the more sophisticated behavior gets to be. Okay? And this is what we've learned, that after a certain, and this is why, um, if you remember the original graph that I had, um, I'm going to try to go back to it. It's, it's several slides back, but um, so this green line here, okay, this green line is white matter. So early on in, in a child's life, in infancy, it's very, very not important. Okay? It has white matter, but the number of white matter uh, axons, uh, uh, the number of myelinated axons that it has are very low. This doesn't mean it doesn't have axons. The actual number of axons are higher. This green line does not represent the number of axons. It represents the number of myelinated axons, which is very low. Okay? But as it grows, the amount of myelination increases because myelination allows those neurons to be much faster behave, acting, right? The signal moves in a much faster way, and the neurons can actually be long, the, the um, axons can grow to longer lengths. So this is the reason, and, and this is the reason why sophisticated behavior actually starts to develop later in life, in the teen years and later. Um, this is also the reason why I suspect why our societies have developed, the way our school systems have developed, that what we teach in preschool years and what we teach in you know, the middle years and high school years and college years, right? We teach many sophisticated subjects in college because our brain physically is capable of learning sophisticated things by that line. But a, but a teenager's brain is only so able to understand so many sophisticated things that physically has not matured to the level that it can learn very sophisticated, nuanced types of topics. That's I suspect why our schooling system have been designed around this because our brain physically hasn't developed until, the, until those years. So myelination is very important. These interconnections are really what govern the sophisticated aspects of learning. Okay? 
Um, that's something that's very important for us to know. Um, it's not the number of neurons, it's not the types of neurons, it's not the structure of neurons, but it's the number of myelinations, um, the interconnections. And when we're talking about interconnections, we're not talking only about interconnections on a regional basis, on a local basis, not just between, you know, like if you, if you talk about within a certain area of the brain, there, there are millions of neurons near each other, okay? and they all communicate with each other. Also, some of those neurons have very, very long axons that go into other regions of the brain, completely other regions of the brain. You might have your visual neurons in your visual system that connect with neurons in your auditory system. And so when you hear the sound of a dog, or when you see the image of a, of a dog, okay, in one sense, you actually excite the, um, the neurons that have the ability to hear that dog. And so you're more prone to imagine the auditory sound of a dog when you see a picture. This is the reason why, because the auditory system and the visual system relative to the concept of a dog, the encoding of a dog in our neuronal system is linked between the auditory and visual. And they're linked across many areas of our brain. These interconnections and the sophistication of the interconnections, especially as they get interlinked into our prefrontal cortex, into our frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the newest part of our evolutionary brain. And the prefrontal cortex is the newest, newest part of our brain. So as the interconnections in the rest of our brain expand into the, corte the frontal and the prefrontal cortex, and as those interconnections become more sophisticated, that's when we become much more highly intelligent. That's when critical thinking skills develop. That's when we gain the ability to um, have regulation of, of complex behaviors and things like that. So this is why we say that only in your college years. And this is why we say that people who have had this type of education, why education is so important for these skills, because these are things that don't happen automatically. They don't happen by the physical brain going. They happen by the lessons that you learn from other human beings teaching them to you. Okay. So the, the last line, I'm going to expand on in further slides. So optimizing. So the optimal number of interconnections and the topology of the interconnections is really where the sophistication of our brain is. And that's really what when we talk about in intelligence and we talk about sophisticated human, human behavior. This is what drives a lot of it. It's not neurons. It's not the number of neurons. Um, it is the structure of neurons, the multiple layers, because what we see in, in other primates is that other primates actually don't have six layers of, it, of, of in the neocortex. Most of them have around three or four layers maximum. And that's one of the things that, that we, we've learned um, recently in the last 10 years is that um, many, even most of the most advanced primates don't have many layers in the neocortex, whereas we do. So that aspect, as well as the um, interconnections and the topology of the white matter, these are the most important parts of sophisticated intelligent behavior. So I think this is another, so these are just some additional images of, of interconnections. So th this on this right side is an example of two different neurons. For those of you who may have difficulties imagining a neuron, um, this dark um, black dot in the middle is the, um, is the nucleus of the neuron. That's where the DNA is in the neuron. That's where the, all the machinery of the neuron keeps it alive and above it, is a dendritic tree. Okay? It's, it's like this branching web. Okay? And bottom, below it, you see this, this thin single line. You see a few more lines, but those other lines are actually um, glial cells that form the structure. If you think of the, the, um, the, uh, um, the, um, the, the layering, you know, the, the multiple layering, the glial cells are in the background kind of, uh, but this, this wavy kind of diagonal, slightly diagonal, vertical, thick line on the bottom is the axon. And if you think of that axon connecting to the, to the um, dendrites that are below on the, on the cell below this, that's actually how communication happens between these neurons, is the axon sends a signal outward all the way to the end of the axon, and the neurotransmitters get released. Those neurotransmitters then go into, and they per, uh, permeate across the dendrites and of the next act of the next neuron, and then they carry the signal into the nucleus, and then that nucleus, then certain functions happen. It, it gets amplified, and then it, if it if it's above a certain threshold, it may generate a new signal from that second neuron firing into a third neuron, etc. So that's how the cascading of signals. One neuron causes its neighboring neurons to also turn on or turn off. It actually, this is actually very complicated because neurotransmitters. Some neurotransmitters actually turn off the firing of, of your neighboring neurons. Others turn on the firing of your neighboring neurons. So it's very, very sophisticated what happens here. But these interconnections 
are vitally important in all of this. Um, so I think we can we can uh, okay. So let me. So one of the things here. So we're going to talk about the the so the infant's brain. Um, some of the things that it's learning is self awareness. Okay, it's learning to realize that it is an organism that and it, this is not very advanced. It doesn't have a advanced intellectual understanding. It just has a very rudimentary understanding that it's a thing. Okay, and when it sees this hand moving. Eventually, it realizes it's its own hand, okay? and that's the concept of self-awareness. It probably, if it sees its own image in a mirror, it probably will not recognize itself in the mirror. But because, and, and this is why I have the feedback loop at, at the title here, because feedback loops are extremely important in biology, but also the extremely important brain and learning. So when a baby sees its hand moving, and it, so in the beginning, when an infant is born, okay, when the infant is born on day one, it is incapable of doing anything. It can't even go to the bathroom on its own. Its autonomic nervous system allows it to urinate and, and defecate, things like that. Its breathing is handled by its autonomic nervous system. So those aspects of, of it, the brain, which are in, you can think of the brain stem. The brain stem, again, is the primordial part of our brain because, again, in evolution, it was one of the first things that developed because all animals need to breathe, or most of the even primitive animals need some type of respiration. So that's one of the first parts of the brain that developed in every animal. And in us, it's one of the first things that develops. It's worst, It's one of the most, most um, fully developed parts of our brain when we're born, is our circulatory system, our respiratory system, our, um, our uh, temperature control, our, our physiological control system. These are all the autonomic nervous system aspects of our central nervous system. So they all are there. So a baby cannot move its arms and limbs because it has not, that part of its brain has not developed fully. But what happens over time, over the first few months is that the brain will randomly, in a baby's brain, there'll be random neurons firing. This is very important to understand that initially random, random behavior, and random behavior is important in many areas of biology. In the, in the infant's brain, random behavior will cause random neurons to fire um, because the baby is getting nourishment. Okay? It's getting food, it's getting energy. And that energy is carried through its a circulatory system into its brain. And the circulatory system into the brain, the energy um, gets taken out from, um, or actually it's the oxygen gets taken out from glial cells. And the glial cells, because they, they interact with our circulatory system of the brain, and they, they take oxygen out. And oxygen is what's important for uh, metabolism, right? Oxygen is important for generation of ATP. ATP is one of the precursor molecules for energy production, ATP, ADP, if you remember biology. And, and that molecule is basically the, the basis of energy in, in every cell in the human body. And that, when you have a proliferation of ATP, ATP is one of the precursors to, to almost all neurotransmitters. The formation of neurotransmitters requires ATP and ADP. So because the baby's brain is getting so much ATP and ADP, which is a form of energy, that's a form of, of glucose, you can say. Glucose and all the sugars, that the baby drinks. And this is the reason why babies are given milk, because milk is basically a sugar. Okay? It has sugar and fat both, but sugar is the most important part of, for a baby. All of that energy in the brain causes, it, it excites neurons and gives energy to those neurons, and randomly they randomly fire. Okay? And when these neurons randomly fire, what happens is, so if you think of one part of the brain which controls the motor muscles, motor, motor uh, neurons, which control the limbs of the hand, and I'm not talking about the, the arm, the fingers. I'm talking about the gross movement of, of the elbow and the shoulder. So when you see a newborn, within days, it's, it's basically moving its arms back and forth. But it's doing it in a random way. It really doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't even, it's not even aware. The reason why it's doing it is because of these random firings of the brain. And these random firings over time become so um, the magnitude. So it's not, and initially, it'll just be a few neurons firing. But after it becomes several hundred neurons, then those several hundred neurons will have enough electricity to actually cause a muscle to twitch, okay? And when that muscle twitches, the baby will notice its eye, you know, and again, its eye is not fully formed, but you know, if the eye, and the eye is also developing in, in, in a parallel form, this is the initial formation of a feedback loop, that the baby's eyes will notice its own limbs twitching and moving in a random way. Initially, it has no idea that it's moving it or its brain is moving it. It doesn't even know that it's so, it, that 
limb that's moving is its own limb. Over a few weeks, it starts to realize that's its own body. That's the start of self-awareness. And after that, what happens is because it's of this feedback loop between the motor neurons and the visual system and other parts of the brain, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is very important in controlling um, movement, okay, of, of motor control, um, but it also does a few other things. Um, the parietal lobe is the part that is mostly important for sensory input. So what the baby is doing is, believe it or not, um, the baby's brain, um, and this is also already fairly well developed by the time of birth, is the proprioceptor uh, mechanism, which is that when, you're move, when we move our limbs, even if we close our eyes, we still have a fairly good idea of where our limb is in space, even though our eyes are completely closed. So the baby is relying on that aspect. If that aspect is getting trained and made, made more sophisticated um, as part of its first few months. The occipital lobe is the visual center at the back. The temporal lobe is, is not really that, and the frontal lobe, these are not being used as much. But the cerebellum, the parietal occipital lobe are used the first few weeks of life and probably the first two, two, or two to five months of life. Because that, and, and they together allow it to develop this ability to move its limbs to the point where it can start to control its limbs. By, initially, by this random motion of limbs, the baby starts to realize that through its visual system and, and through its proprioceptors, um, its, its sense of its, its body movement, body position, um, it is able to learn that these particular neurons in this particular part of my brain causes this muscle to twitch in this way. And as it learns to do that, it learns to exercise that more and more until it eventually realizes how to make its limb move in a specific direction. But that movement is not very smooth. It's very rough in the beginning. Okay? It kind of jerks its, its hand into position. And as time progresses, that, that develops more sophisticated movement. So this is how, from infant brain, the brain starts to learn the most basic forms of controlling its body. And, and that, after it learns to control its body, this level of self-awareness starts to form. And then emotional regulation in a similar way, once, and, and we have to remember that as the brain has formed, the brain also has integration into the rest of the body. Okay? And the brain is able to sense um, neurotransmitters that exist within our body, within our gut. And those neurotransmitters actually communicate emotions and feelings to our brain. So emotions and feelings actually exist in our body. They're not just in our brain, they actually exist in our body. So the baby infant starts to sense some of those emotions. For example, if it's hungry, that's the most obvious one. If it has to urinate, those are obvious ones. But also if it's scared or if it's, if it's um, nervous or if, if, it, if it senses that, there's, that mommy or daddy is standing behind it where it can't see mom, mommy or daddy, right? If, if, or if maybe they can smell through their olfactory system. But it, the formation of emotions start to develop. And eventually that goes into what's known as self-regulation of emotions. So when a baby initially will cry randomly, or it might cry based on its physical sensations of hunger and, and, and temperature and urination, right? It'll, it'll cry and, and, and react based on physical sensation. But eventually it'll start to have emotions inside of itself. And it's still, it'll start to regulate those emotions. It'll, it'll learn to regulate those emotions. And that's where the limbic system comes in hind brain and the midbrain. And the temporal lobes slightly start to come in and into these parts. And the brainstem is always there, the cerebellum and the parietal lobe, it's, they're always there. And actually even a, a part of the frontal cortex, which is the motor sensory cortex, um, these are also there and, and very function, fully active in the infant brain. Going into the child, the, the, the uh, toddler and, and the preschool years, the theory of mind starts to develop. This is where a child starts to realize other people have their own brain up to the age of four, roughly. Before the age of four, a child does not know that their parent has a separate brain. This is the reason why when you play peekaboo, the child actually thinks that the world has disappeared. If you, if you cover your, if, if the child covers their eyes, they think the world actually disappears. They don't realize that, you know, the world stays and it's just their visual system that's covered. Um, and that realization, in theory of mind doesn't give them that realization, that realization actually comes later. The theory of mind gives them the realization that what they see through their eyes is different than what mommy and daddy see through their eyes. And that mommy and daddy's brain might feel pain where I might not feel pain. But mommy and daddy might be happy and I might not be happy, or I might be happy and mommy and daddy might not be happy. So the theory of mind starts to develop in young children around the age of four. 
um, language also starts to develop at this point. And language develops because we are social animals and we teach language to our children. If we don't teach language, the child will not develop language or we'll have very rudimentary languages like we see in the, in the, in the higher apes, in the, in, in the higher primates. They have language, but their languages are very simple. Um, and, and humans will also probably have very simple languages if you don't teach them to our children. Um, social interpersonal learning, this also begins to happen in children. This is, again, sophisticated. And these um, embody more and more other areas of our brain. And I, I listed in very rough fashion, each of these areas actually have many, many, many sub areas of the brain and it's too detailed to go into. And actually we don't even know fully all of the different areas of the brain that are, are involved in these. So it's, it's not helpful to talk about it at this level. Those are more in the research level, which I'm talking about here. Now, lastly about, lastly about teens. Um, teens are actually um, where, where sophisticated behavior starts to come in. And um, so, you know, I, I've listed just some of these, some of the more prominent ones. So risk-taking, impulsivity, these are things that we know all teens have. Some of the reasons why this happens is, is twofold. One is because um, this feedback loop that I talked about at the top, Feedback loop is very important in biology and in brain. And one of the feed, many of the feed, some of the feedback loops that occur in the teenage brain is the regulation of neurotransmitters and regulation of, of, of signaling in general, okay, not, not just neurotransmitter based signaling, all kinds of signaling. So, and that happens through feedback. So, a, in the, a young teenager who might be 11 or 12, um, a lot of their behavior is driven by um, the sex hormones, um, estrogen, and, and, and uh, um, uh, um, adrenal hormones, um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, and and so they're they're not even aware that their brain is being affected by these hormones. But as they start to see their own behavior change, they become aware of that, and they start to learn that these hormones. They don't understand the reason. They don't understand their hormones inside of them, inside of their brain and body. But they start to understand that that the way they feel cause them to behave in certain ways. And they start to, to learn to regulate their emotional behavior. And that learning to regulate happens by them learning to regulate the release and absorption of various neurotransmitters and neurochemicals. That happens over time. That's one type of feedback loop that happens in the teenage brain. Another type of feedback loop is, is what I might call, and, and this is more in the, in the physical, right? Reward pathways. So reward pathways develop in, in, in the brain very early. Um, because a baby needs to learn very early on that it has to attach to its parents. Attachment is an important part of our biology and our, and our neurobiology. So we learn to attach, and many animals, many mammals do that. They attach to one of the first animals that they see, humans also. Um, so we attach to our parents because we see them early on in our, in our uh, developmental years. And, and that remains, and that actually gets programmed into our, into our brain. And also, we have reward pathways in terms of food, in, ter in terms of sexual function, although for children, sexual function is very different than, than, than what most people think of it as. Um, there are reward pathways for many things, but the reward pathways are, are hardwired and they actually develop very early in, in the, in, within the first one to two years. But by the time a teenager becomes a, te a child becomes a teenager, those reward pathways are very undisciplined. They're not trained in a sophisticated way. And this, this initially creates the high risk taking and impulsivity types of behavior. And as a child starts to develop that, um, it starts to learn to manage that and to become more adult-like. And also the prefrontal cortex, if you remember, the physical brain grows at different rates. So the prefrontal cortex doesn't grow in a, it has not grown much in a teenager. A teenager probably doesn't even have six layers of the neurons that we talked about, okay? Um, so, it's almost impossible for a teenager to do what an adult does in many ways. So it's unfair to, to expect a teenager to, to, to behave like an adult in some ways because their physical brain is not capable of doing it. Also, they have not learned to regulate and manage and control uh, important aspects of the brain. This is what teenage years are about. They're actually learning how to do this. And there was a book that I read years ago that, that opened my eyes to this, but it basically said that teenage brain is very much like a crazy brain. And this is, um, somebody asked the question about mental illness. Mental illness is another aspect where a lot of these neurotransmitters are dysregulated. They're not regulated in the proper way. Or the physical um, development of the brain has not happened in the right way. This happens, we believe in ADHD and certain other um, disorders, where the physical growth of the brain has not happened in the right way. So either of these 
of these um, very uh, important um, mechanisms, either physical functioning or um, uh, signaling, neurotransmitter or other types of signaling, either or both of those cause teenagers to behave in the way that they do. And over time, so one of the, these other two bullets, last bullets here are, the reason why they're important is because in humans, um, we learn by watching others and we learn by um, uh, being regulated by others. So for example, our parents, if you, most teenagers hate their parents or are very angry with the parents. Because what the parent is doing, the parent is putting restrictions on the teenager. Restrictions in a, in a psychological sense tell the teenager you can't do things that the teenager wants to. Remember, the reward pathways are causing the teenager to want things that it should not want. Okay? It, it, it makes the teenager behave in ways that it should not be behaving. It makes the teenager want to eat junk food, right? to eat candy, to drink soda all the time, to not exercise, to um, not study, to sleep too late. Right? All of the behaviors that we associate with teenagers actually driven by physiological behaviors that their brain has learned to do. And a parent telling the, the, the teenager not to do that is in a way regulating the teenager. So this feedback loop in humans extends outside of our physical brain and outside of our body, it extends into our society. And in the primates, it also extends outside, but most mammals, it doesn't extend outside the body much. In humans, it does. So these last two bullets under teens are very important because the reason why we go from a teenager to an adult is because of society. Society teaches us how to be an adult. Therefore, if we don't learn, if we don't live in a, in a society that is adult-like, we will remain like a teenager. This is the reason why if you grow up in a, in a society where um, people don't behave in adult-like fashion, the children will mimic that behavior for the rest of their life. They'll never become adult-like in, in other societies. Um, this is, it, you may say it's a positive or a negative, but this is just the way our brain is. So for, uh, you, we have to have caring, trusted parents for a teenager who listen to what the parent is saying. And then that feedback allows them to modify the functioning of the brain because they trust that parent, they realize the parent cares for them, and then they modify their brain function. Also, the parent has to um, allow the teen to fail. So um, the parent has to let the teen do things. So basically, very tight, strict control over a child is not good either. It's, it's both. You have to give feedback, but you also have to let them fail. So this is how teenagers will learn responsibility by, by, by learning to fail. When they fail and they see the consequences and the repercussions of doing things, they, they learn to fail. The, you know, some of the drawbacks to this is that sometimes teenagers do certain behaviors where failure is catastrophic. They, you, you have teenage pregnancy. You have... You have um, um, you have a drug addiction, or alcohol addiction, you have um, crime, you have various aspects in teenage years that occur because the com complex combination of all of these things are not sufficiently sophisticated, meaning the brain is not sufficiently developed or the reward pathways have been made strengthened too much in the in infancy. So for example, if a child grew up in a, in a, in a family where the reward pathways were, were developed too much, that child will probably have difficulty becoming an adult. And probably that child would be, be more likely to be addicted either to alcohol or to drugs or to something else, even gambling or things. Um, also the relationships and the society that they have, we, the, the phrase takes a village to, to raise a child. This is this aspect of it, where if a child based on the area or the society that it, that it grows up in, um, it will, it will it will um, behave in certain ways that cause catastrophic failure in its life. For example, it commits a crime and then it gets into the juvenile um, uh, penal system. And from then its life is, is on a very dangerous trajectory, right? Or it, it, it either a, a, a girl or a boy uh, gets someone pregnant, right? And that again, puts your life in a very uh, dangerous trajectory. Um, so all of these types of behaviors, depending on the type of external regulation from adults around them, can also affect how the teenage develops into an adult. So these are all aspects of learning and developing of the teenage brain. So um, I don't know if you, I mean, do you want me to go into Q&A at this point or? Uh, let's, no, okay. So uh, let's do one thing. Um, it's, um, uh, I want to go to breakout rooms, short breakout rooms of about okay. 10 minutes. So people can talk about, you know, whatever they've gotten from this and then we can come back and uh, do takeaways. Okay, uh, and at that point, you can also ask any question that you have. 
All right, so I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. Give me just a second. Um, should I put the uh, questions in the breakout room? Uh, no, let's, let's keep it open so that people can, uh, you know, because it's a long thing. Uh, people will have many things to discuss. So I, I would recommend just uh, doing that. Okay, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Sanjay, fantastic presentation, by the way. I, I, was, okay. I, I, I was completely at the edge of my seat throughout. I'm All right. worried if I'm going to be able to finish or not, but anyway. We'll okay. uh, starting the breakout rooms now. <laughs> Next time. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so it's time for takeaways. Uh, and you can, if you want, you can put a question on the table uh, as well. So would really love to hear what, what you got from the presentation. Uh, in order to do that, just go ahead and type exclamation mark uh, if you'd like to share what you learned from the presentation. Would like to go first. You can go ahead and type exclamation mark or you can raise your hand in Zoom, whatever you prefer. Mike, I'll give you two minutes, Mike. Go ahead. Okay, a couple things uh, uh, that tie in with, a lot, with uh, what's coming up Saturday too. Yes. Uh, if, if we started out with a uh, situation where the baby is born without consciousness. Now we say he uh, doesn't know even uh, where he where he is, uh, uh, how where the position of his hand is when he moves his hand. He doesn't know uh, anything. If he grew up in a cave and his parents didn't know, or the the society didn't know any of these things. Um, it, that's uh, kind of self-limiting, and uh, from that viewpoint, uh, that's th that is um, uh, 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 why they think anthropologically and archaeologically consciousness didn't really emerge at the same level until around 5,000 years ago, and then it exponentially took off. Uh, that's one item. The second item is uh, we say there's 10 to the uh, 12th neurons, and uh, if uh, and uh, that sounds like an infinite number, but now that we know with computers a terabyte of data is not that much, and if you uh, to be able to do face recognition, uh, for example, and all the things we talked about in today's. Um, uh, uh, material in today's lecture and today's material, which I think was excellent, uh, we could easily refer to 10 to the 12th uh, bits of data. And so uh, we, if, if we store a uh, picture and pixelate it into bits, uh, that, that isn't going to work. So that's why some people say that the, pro the, the seat of memory is not the uh, neurons, but is the uh, synapses between uh, the, in the interconnections, and uh, that and uh, that uh, is gives an, another dimension of storage, which uh, is uh, five orders of magnitude beyond that uh, to store things. Uh, thank and you, Mike. I'll yield the balance of my time. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, next up is Jean, Kevin, and Alex. Jean. Uh, yeah, this is quite interesting. I miss a little bit, but uh, the part about the teenager brain, I found is quite fascinating. Uh, I actually have two teenagers, so I would really interested to have more in-depth discussion about how we can help the teenager to better develop their brain. But I did learn, actually, I want to ask the questions about ADHD, because I heard the ADHD kids, their frontal lobe develop slower than other kids, like two or three years slower. I want to know your input on that. But at the same time, they're very creative. So, and also um, we were talking about the, uh, there was a wolf boy, like the boy was raised in the wolf in the nature. And I wonder how his brain developed without environment, you know, I know they were trying to bring him back to society. Okay. So those are interesting things I want to know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin followed by Alex. If anybody else wants to share their takeaways, you can go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I'm fascinated about our use of brain to build it or use it uh, to lose it. My question actually is, uh, 
Uh, how about it? Do we use our brain too much? Because we need to sleep, it could be sometimes overloaded to damage the brain. Uh, could it, maybe as uh, this statement is true, we use only 10% of our, our brain. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is Alex. Yeah, I, my takeaway is actually on the proning of the, the uh, is it the neurons? Um, I find it really fascinating that we, you know, were born with so many more neurons and then we, we actually lose so much of it, you know, uh, as we age. So that's, that's my takeaway. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, so my, my takeaway, uh, Sanjay, I think Sanjay, this is go going really well. Uh, this series of presentations because it is laying down kind of a lot of common knowledge and which we are going to be able to count on. And what I've done on the uh, YouTube channel is that I've created a separate list. And for every one of your presentations, I give a link to that playlist, uh, you know, neuroscience playlist. So people can go and I encourage people to go ahead and, you know, uh, watch the previous videos. Um, so I think this is incredible. I, you know, I was completely blown away by the presentation. The biggest thing, I, I mean, for, first thing that I wanted to repeat, you know, just the aesthetic appeal of looking at biological things, you know, it is mind boggling. You know, you think you, you're creative, <laughs> you look at what, it, you know, it's not, I know that it's not a conscious process. It is a, you know, it is a biological process, but there is a beauty to that. And there is an enormous amount of complexity that is, being produced by very simple processes. And it is always, you know, very inspirational for me to look at that. Uh, but the biggest thing that I got from it is uh, the glial cells and their role uh, in the entire thing, because it really transforms um, the way I think about, I'm thinking about the brain, because it seems like the structure of the brain is far more sophisticated and far more nuanced than I had thought. Uh, and glial cells seems to be a very critical part of making that happen. Uh, so it looks like the neurons actually live in these glial cells. It is this, you know, it is the structure in which these ne neurons function. Uh, so I, I thought that that was really wonderful. Uh, so, uh, uh, Rajin, Rajin, go ahead. What are your takeaways? Uh, I was just going to point out there's a new movie out, News of the World. And I read the book um, not that long ago. And the uh, two main characters, well, it's about a young girl who gets captured back. Uh, Rajin, um, you'll have to keep it short, okay? Because we are we are very late, so you'll have to keep it short. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a young girl who gets captured back from a Native American community. And in the book, you see how her behavior um, isn't, isn't typical and becomes how she becomes more socialized but how the man she's traveling with changes too. So if anybody's interested, news of the world just came out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajin. All right, uh, Sanjay, any closing thoughts? Uh, let's not go into the questions. It's a little bit late, uh, but uh, any closing thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I, I think, um, I mean, for me, this, this is a, um, Something that I enjoy, um, and and uh, I mean, I didn't gain any, any necessarily any any uh, additional understanding today. But I think um, this this area of glial cells is, is extremely important. And so, one of the things that that that, that I want to leave everyone with um, in terms of takeaways is that um, many of the areas that, that I'm talking about are just introductory in one sense. I mean, the, each of these areas can actually be gone in depth. It's 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 such a broad field. It's such a broad area, and 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 it encompasses all of biology. Biology itself is such a broad area, um, and the interactions and the interplay between all these things are so difficult to explain. Um, that you know what we're talking about here are really simplified versions of it, and also um, 
neuroscience is not an advanced, is not a long uh, existing science. It's, it's only been around for about 40 years, 30 years, 35 years, um, uh, you know, in, in using sophisticated tools. So um, it's relatively new. And so there's a tremendous amount that we're learning. And, and so there's a lot of new knowledge that we're gaining almost every year, every two years. There, there are revolutionary changes that are occurring in almost every five years. So it's, you know, so I, I think, you know, when people ask questions, it, it helps um, other people also, and it, help, it, it reminds me sometimes, bring up a, a topic that, uh, that uh, I, I forgot to, to bring up because there's so many interrelated things. Yeah, and I also want to say, you know, uh, connected to what you're saying is that I, I think that what you're doing is remarkable because it is actually providing a very simple introduction to a very complex field, which is very difficult to do because otherwise when you, when you actually, anybody goes to study, navigating through this complexity is very tough because there's just so much going on and it is, and that's a good thing. Because it's like, and that's how, you know, that's what good knowledge, you know, good explosion of knowledge or golden age of a field looks like. That there is just so much going on that, you know, it's hard to just keep up with it every day. And in the midst of it, so, and what happens is that the, the advantage of these presentations is that it allows people a good starting point. Uh, you know, I think you're doing a very good job of kind of giving very simple, direct, um, you know, introductions to these fields. Um, and so, so thank you so much. I, I really appreciate these. These are wonderful. I mean, for me personally, these are amazing because it's yeah. like on, on one thing is I, I, I've looked at it somewhat. So it's kind of reiteration of something, but this field is so fascinating that even when you've looked at something, you see something and say, wow, that folding, isn't that amazing? You know, just the idea of folding, you know, what can you do with folding? Uh, so go ahead. I mean, just, I, I want to say, I mean, my, my style of presentation and, and how I communicate with people early in my life, I, I learned not to use sophisticated language or, or advanced languages with people because many reasons why. I mean, it, it turns off some people, some people, they, they don't understand it or, or, you know, there are positives also. Some people actually prefer that, but, but I, I, I try to communicate. I, I've taken the approach that if I can explain something to a child or a teenager, that's the right thing to do. And that's the approach, that, not to say that people are children or teenagers, but if, if, if you can communicate complex ideas using concepts in that realm, in that, tech, in that way, um, and, and if you can communicate the depth of those ideas in that way, that's a better way to do it, I feel. Um, so one, one of the last things that I want to talk about is that, you know, when we're talking about, like, you know, you're, you're saying there, there's so much depth that you pick up as, as we're talking about various things. Um, one of the things, you know, as I was putting this, this presentation together, there's many things that I wanted to put in there. And one thing that came to mind, I didn't put it in, but one thing that, that I think is important for us to understand is that um, biology, you know, pe people think of biology as this complicated mechanism where everything works well. But that's not how biology actually started, or that's not how biology, the path that it's taken over, over the years. Um, and if you look at evolution, it actually shows it all the time. Uh, so one example I wanted to give is that the example you know, of, of this baby moving its arm, right, flipping its arm and learning to, to control its muscles and controlling its arm, et cetera. The biology of it and the, and the, uh, the, neuro, the, the neurophysiology of it is very, very complicated. What actually happens is that and, and when I describe that our brain actually has multiple parts, because our brain has multiple parts and because we evolved over time, some parts of our brain actually do that. Other parts of our brain interfere with it. Other parts of our brain try to overcome the interference. So it's this really complicated dynamics of just the baby learning to move a simple limb. And so what actually happens is the pathway, if you, if you understand it, we might go into this at some point, maybe two or three uh, even talks later, but it, just the act of a baby moving its arm in one direction, one muscle moving in one direction, is a circuitous path of going through um, one part of the brain into another, into another, going back to the same part, going to another, going back to the same part, and then to, to another, and then into the muscles. It's this five path way. What you would think is a single direction, you know, the neuron tells the muscle to move. It's that simple. But because our brain evolved it over so much time, and because multiple parts of our brain 
evolved to do the same thing. So for example, the cerebellum evolved as one of our primitive brains. So all primitive mammals have it. But we still have our cerebellum. And our cerebellum is still there. And our cerebellum is still used for us in our muscle movements. But that's the reason why this path that goes kind of ends up in its way back into the cerebellum and then has to find its way out of the cerebellum into our cortex. And this is the reason why we have circuitous path of just moving a single muscle. It's, it's so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically feedback systems. You know, it's like yeah. multiple feedback systems which give us tremendous adaptability and, you know, a, a far, more, um, far more richer repertoire that we can build with this, you know, so many feedback loops at so many different levels. And there is a lot of trial and error, you know, so you try something, there is a lot of kind of building out and pruning, uh, you know, constantly. I want to add one more thing to what you said. I think the, the point about speaking to a child is fantastic. But I think in this particular field of neuroscience, I think one of the things that you're doing, which is remarkable, is that there are two things actually. One is the science of it, and second is the experience of it. What you're doing is that you are able to actually connect those two things as you go along. So people can kind of see what it feels like at the experiential level, and they can connect to what you're saying at the science level. So there are presentations that do a fantastic job of just the science part, but they don't talk about the experiential level as much. I think you are doing, you're, you're kind of pro providing both of them, which makes the communication, which makes actually appreciation of the science deeper because you can say, okay, what is the result, net result of it that I experience? So, so this is wonderful. So thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. See you, uh, see you folks uh, next time. And thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thanks everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you.